I want to remind us, before we get into it, I want to remind us about when we talked about be, fighting the good fight of faith. You guys remember that? Yeah. Fighting the good fight of faith, there's a vow that if anyone who ever wants to join the U.S. military makes, it goes like this, right? I blank, that's your name, right, okay. Nelson? Do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all for enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to the regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me, God. Amen. That's a pretty powerful oath right there. And that's an oath that people make to become loyal servants and soldiers, hard-fighting soldiers of the United States. But as disciples of Jesus, there's also an oath that we took on the day that we made our good confession. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. And I hope this morning you guys brought your Bible or you're able to look along with someone next to you. Because we're going to be reading the Word of God because we are a Bible church. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, it says, To fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses, in the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. And the church said, Amen. Amen. The question is, are you still fighting the good fight of faith this morning? Or the oath that you made. You know, it's pretty awesome. This past Wednesday, we got to see Phoebe make her oath. <laughs> And that oath before God is Jesus is Lord. When you make that commitment, it's something that you say through your faith, but it is a confession and it is a vow before God that Jesus is going to be Lord and he's going to stay Lord of my life for the rest of my life. I'm recognizing who Jesus Christ truly is as Lord. And we got to witness Phoebe make Jesus Lord this past week and be baptized. We got to think about our own oath. Has our oath expired? We made an oath, a vow of faithfulness to God and to his kingdom. But sometimes I think we can forget that we're hard-fighting soldiers. So when life gets tough, we can ask, why is God allowing this to happen to me? Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Just a little reminder from a few weeks ago, guys. 2 Timothy 2. That's after 1 Timothy, in case you're wondering where 2 Timothy is. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 3 says, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Wow. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Are we good soldiers or are we too entangled with civilian affairs? You know, being a soldier... When it's time to go to battle, how would you feel if every soldier in the army was like, wait, I actually have to go fight now? Uh, uh -oh. Please excuse me, I, I, uh, I just bought a new uh, HDTV, it was Black Friday, okay? Uh -oh. or, or, no, please excuse me, I, um, I'm finishing dinner first before, you know, I go fight this, this battle. Or, please excuse me, you know, I just got this really awesome computer, right, Joe? Oh, yeah. and, and I'm playing my flight simulator. Or, please excuse me, right? I, I have too much going on in my life right now. But, but we can't make that excuse to God when it's time to fight the good fights. Please excuse me. I just I picked up extra hours at work, and I just have too much on my plate right now. I can't do this whole Christianity thing the way that Jesus expects me to. Please excuse me. But, you know, even the world gets it. The kingdom of the world, right? Let's say the president of the United States. He's the officer, right? People are willing to sign up and to obey orders of the president, even to their own life dying. But you know what's crazy? The president didn't die for your sins. No, you're right. The president didn't die for your sins. The prime minister didn't die for your sins. Jesus Christ died for your sins. Yes. And he rose from the dead, which is pretty awesome. But, but even as a soldier in the army, if you go AWOL, you get in trouble. You get in trouble. AWOL, absent without leave, right? You have to show up where your officer tells you to show up. Otherwise, you get in some pretty big trouble. You can be court-martialed and put into military prison. But uh, we can't just be AWOL in the church either, guys. 
we can't just show up when we feel like it. We actually have to remember we're hard fighting soldiers and the devil's not going to take a day off. So if the devil's not going to take a day off, then we can't take a day off either. Now, we're talking about the strategy of Satan because Satan is our enemy. And that's something we have to remember here. Sometimes as people, we can focus on other people and think that people are our enemy. But it's really Satan who's truly our enemy. We're talking through the strategy of Satan. Last week, we talked about how Satan is the deceiver. Remember, these lessons are a little bit different because we talk about instead of, say, point number one, point number two, point number three, we're looking at a few different aspects of how Satan wants to target us. So the first point this morning is the target. What is Satan going to be targeting? Number two, what weapons does Satan use? The weapons, the target, the weapons. Number three, his goal. Number four, what is our defense against Satan? Right? Last week, the target was, uh, was Eve in her mind. Right? Satan, as a serpent, attacked Eve in her mind and tried to deceive her. His weapons were deception and lies. That's how Satan gets into our mind, is through lies, wants us to believe things that are not true. The ultimate goal was to make Eve ignorant of God's word. Did God really say I shouldn't do this? What does God really say? Maybe God actually meant this instead of what he actually said. And then what's our defense against Satan, who's going to do the same thing for us? We have to hold to God's word. We have to know the word of God. And we can't just know, think we know the Bible if we're not really applying it. You know, I learned the Bible growing up. I knew a lot about the Bible, but in, in terms of application and what it looks like to put it into practice, a lot of it I just had no idea. When I was in football in about eighth grade, maybe my freshman year of high school, I had this lineman coach. I was pretty bad at football, not going to lie. But I gave my whole heart to learning how to play football, and uh, this lineman coach had pity on me. He gave me this book, and it said, How to Play Football Like a Champion. I'm not going to lie. And he gave it to me, and I was like... Okay, what if I read this? Like, how is that going to help me out there? Like, how, you know, but, but it's true. Sometimes we think just because we know, I could have read that whole book, but if I never figured out how to apply it on the field, it would have never done anything. So we got to treat God's word as not just something to learn up here, but to actually figure out how to fight against the devil's schemes. Because the devil's not just up here. He's going to attack you in the field. So today... The strategy of Satan, we got to see who Satan really is. Sa the title of the lesson this morning is Satan the Destroyer. Mm. Satan the Destroyer. And it's been kind of a tough one as a church. Many of us are here today, and I don't think anyone's homesick that I'm aware of. But last Sunday, it didn't look like that. This past couple weeks, it's been a, a, an attack physically even. Andres and Georgina both got hit with COVID. Right? They're back here, which is pretty awesome. Joe and Janet were, were, were down and out, right, this past Sunday. Uh, Jade, Jade Nelson as well. Sydney got sick. The other Jade got sick. Brad was sick. He's here today. We're grateful Brad's here. Even Sarita was not there on Wednesday. And even last night, as Sydney and I were driving back from Washington, D.C., I got hit with, like, this weird headache and, like, this lightheadedness, and I was just like... It was so weird. Was, and, uh, you know, Satan can attack you through your body. But health challenges can be a way that Satan wants to get into our hearts. Let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 9. Oh, feel it, Let's go. Revelation chapter 9, verse 11. Mm. Revelation chapter 9, verse 11. It says, they had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is Apollyon, that is destroyer. See, the ruler of the abyss and all of the uh, fallen beings is the destroyer, and that's Satan right there. The king of the abyss is Satan the destroyer. So if Satan, like we talked about, can't deceive you through your mind with getting his lies into your mind, then he's going to come for your body and try to destroy you. And as the body of Christ, because we're the body of Christ, right? He's going to come after us and try to destroy us. We have to be willing to fight. You need a physical fitness, but also a psychological fitness as well, if you're really going to be a soldier, right? Yeah. But and you can read a book, like I talked about, but eventually it's going to be time to get in the ring and learn how to fight the fights. If you can break a man's mind, 
you can break his body. So if Satan knows that he, he can get inside your mind, then he can destroy you. So we have to be on the defense from the lies, right? Like Eve, be on the defense from the lies using the truth. But we have to realize that Satan is going to also come after us, the body of Christ as well. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. In Genesis, it refers to the, the devil as the serpent, right? Let's see what 1 Peter 5, verse 8 says the devil's like. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So the Bible uses certain metaphors to try to help us understand how Satan really operates right here. And here, Satan is a lion. And lions destroy their prey. They destroy their prey. And a lot of times we can feel like when we're being attacked or we feel like we're suffering, that we have this feeling that we're the only one who's going through this and we're all alone. And that's why this passage says that the believers around the world are going through the same kind of sufferings. It encourages us saying we're not, we're not alone, we're suffering together. You know, if, if someone's going to throw a punch at you and you want to block it, how do you block it? You, you, you block it, right? Using your fist or your arm or whatever. But here's what you don't do. Someone's going to punch me. Oh, my finger will block it. Like this. That wouldn't really be a really good defense, would it? I mean, you have a pretty strong finger if you can block a whole punch with a finger. But what's the point? As parts of the body, we have to help each other defend off Satan's attacks. Because we can't just say, oh, I'm by myself. I'm good. I can defend Satan's attacks. You know, no. We got to be able to come together as each part of the body and help each other fight off the attack of the devil to protect each other. And we all agree with this intellectually, like, oh, yeah, we need to be there for each other. It's going to be awesome. But then the struggles actually come, and then we kind of get in our feelings and our emotions, and we're like, oh, we're by, I'm by myself right now. No one wants to help me out. Or maybe we just don't want anyone else to know that we really have a struggle. I'm embarrassed. I don't want anyone else to know what my struggles are. And instead of working together, we can just uh, say things like, well, I'm just going to try to do me and fight off this attack all by myself. Or maybe on the opposite side, we, we, instead of seeing a brother who needs help or a sister who needs help, we kind of just get to ourselves and say, oh, they'll figure that out eventually. we got to be there for each other. But sometimes we get independent. It's kind of like uh, you guys have seen those nature documentaries. I think those things are so cool. Yeah. But the nature documentaries, you have uh, usually, what is his name, David Attenborough. He, he's he's uh, narrating what's happening. You see the lion on the savanna with the, with the zebras. There's a pack of zebras. They're all getting along. Everything's fine. And then one zebra just decides, well, I'm going to do me and walks away from the herd. And, uh, and uh, David Attenborough's in the background. That's what we do, right? We're like, I, you know, the herd hurt my feelings. I'm going to go do my own thing. Or, or this person, you know, got up all in my business and uh, ate some of my patch of grass right here. You know, that's super unfair. And that's what happens. And all the meantime, David Attenborough's like, observe it. As the struggling disciple walks away from the herd. And the zebra just runs away. And, and it's only a matter of time because the lion's just waiting. Because that's what the lion does. The lion waits for you to get alone. Waits for you to, to let your guard down. And then, boom pounces on you and destroys you. And I'm sure the zebra, during all of that, justifies his, uh, his independence and his thoughts with all those excuses. You know, well, I don't really need to be around the church that often. I don't need to be around the body of Christ that often. I can kind of show up when I feel like it. You know, maybe only when I... And then as soon as this lion attacks, what's the zebra thinking? Oh, help, help. You know, I need some help. And by that point in time, it's too late we got to have a serious conviction that if we walk away from the family and the army of God, we can get really hurt spiritually. We can't be naive enough to believe Satan's lies. Otherwise, we can destroy ourselves. So a question for you is, what lies are you listening to that is going to destroy you? What lies are you listening to that will destroy you? 
There are some lies the devil wants us to believe, such as people will never change. Why should I hold out and forgive this person? They're never going to change. Or, you know, why should I give my heart back to someone who hurt me? They're only going to hurt me again. Or, you know, another lie is that the church should never have any problems. So are you kidding me? This is supposed to be the church of God. Are you telling me that somebody in the church sinned? If you think that way, just look at yourself in the mirror. Because, because this church is going to have problems because why? I'm in it. You're in it, right? The church is, is perfect because of what Jesus did. Or, or maybe another lie is like, I just don't have enough time to, to get involved with this battle thing that's going on. I got me to worry about. But what are you really up to? What, what, the things that you are in your life are the things that you're willing to prioritize. Every single person has the same 24 hours. Every single person has the same sunrise, sunset, and whatever happens in between is what they choose to prioritize. So we got to ask ourselves, are we making excuses or are we really prioritizing God in our life? We being like the people, the parable of the great banquet where, where the, the king throws a big banquet. Jesus tells us this parable where he invites everyone that he wanted to invite and everyone just gave him excuses. Well, excuse me, sir, please excuse me. I got to go take care of this new estate that I inherited or excuse me, I got to go take care of these new oxen that I'm going to plow my field with or whatever. And uh, we don't want to be before God after we've lived our whole life saying, well, excuse me, I'll do this later. I'll, I'll repent later. I'll give my heart to God later. And then Jesus is like, oh, well, please excuse you out of line next. We don't want to be in that place. So then we got to ask, what is Satan's target? Because remember, it's the target, the weapons, the goal, and our defense. So what's Satan's target? Let's look at Revelation 12, verse 17. Revelation 12, verse 17. Revelation 12, verse 17. It says, Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. So the dragon, being the devil, wants to wage war against the offspring of who are those who keep God's commands and they hold fast their testimony about Jesus. So in large, Satan is attacking the body of Christ. Satan wants to attack the body of Christ. That's the target. What's the target? The body of Christ. And he's not just trying to weaken our faith, make us feel weak. He's trying to literally destroy us. Yeah. And as the body of Christ, we are one. And we're not just an individual by individual. We're one body. We're working together to fight against the enemy. And we have to be that army together. You know, those who stop sharing their testimony are bound to forget it. And if we stop sharing our testimony with others, we're going to be bound to forget what Jesus has done for our life. And it's going to make that that much easier to give up on our, on our walk with God. So the question is, how is your quiet time this morning? Your time in the word of God this morning? Or were you waiting for right now to be spiritually fed? Because we have to have our own relationship with God. Testifying our testimony has to be like breathing every single day. We breathe in God's word, we really take it in, and then we exhale, and there goes our testimony. We share it with everyone around us. You know, there's some reasons why people choose not to become Christians. When you, when you get into talking to a lot of people, you realize that there's a bunch of simple answers why people really don't want to become Christians. One of the reasons is that they love their traditions. They want to hold to the way that they've always done something in their life. They don't want to let go of the way they've done it before to really do it Jesus' way. Another reason people don't want to become Christians is because they like the approval of people. And they, and they want the praises of men rather than the praises of God. And a, a really simple one is people love sin and the life that they have, the way that they want to do it. And they don't want to give that up. They just want to follow their own ways. But as Christians, we can be dangerously heading in any of these directions even as those who have given our whole hearts to god we can get into tradition as a christian even you know being tradition as a christian what do i mean by that well you go through the routine every single week and everybody has the same week we have a routine that's not a bad thing as a routine but we sometimes associate our relationship with god with the routine that we follow that's how we can get into tradition 
where we start going through the motions, we come to church Sundays, we maybe even go to midweek Wednesdays, and we do the same thing every day in, day out, but our heart drifts all the way over here, and then we wonder why we're, we're getting attacked spiritually and not really standing up to the attacks. We don't want to fall into tradition as disciples. We don't want to fall into tradition even as those who go to church every week. And then when somebody asks you to add something to your schedule, you know you're in tradition as a disciple. If someone asks you to do something a little extra, hey, can you go above and beyond and help with this? And you're like, I don't know if I have time for that. I don't know if I, I, already, I already give my Sundays to the church, right? Instead of focusing on God, you make it about the church. I already give my Sunday to the church. I already do this for the church. And then it's like, wow, you're doing it for the church. Why aren't you doing it for God? We got to do it for God, not for the church. But the church is God's kingdom. Amen. And so and so we have to really focus on in our own walk with God where we are right now. Those of us who are repented, baptized disciples of Jesus. Right. If I were to study the Bible with myself, the question is, would I be convinced that I'm a disciple? If someone studied the Bible with me and walk with me, would they feel confident saying, you know what, this person is a disciple of Jesus and they should get baptized? Would you baptize yourself? That's the question. Or do we show contempt for the first principles, right? We did the first principles class, but it's not just a class. It's Bible studies. It's Bible studies about the elementary teachings of Jesus. And if you've never done the first principles studies before, you should get into the word of God and do the studies because it really teaches you what it means to just do what baby Christians do. And that's how you grow. We don't want to be uh, contemptuous towards the first principles. We got to ask, have we kept our vow? Remember the vow that Jesus is Lord? Have we kept our vow that we're going to be disciples of Jesus to the day we die? Satan attacked Eve through her mind, but he also attacked Job through his body. And that's what we're going to study out today. We're going to look at some Job. Let's go to Job chapter 1. A lot of people know about Job because of how bad this guy suffered. Everyone knows about Job. Even the people that don't believe the Bible have heard about Job. Job chapter 1. Job 1 verse 6. It says, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting here that the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and uh, Satan just kind of snuck his way into their, their daily staff meeting or whatever they were doing. <laughs> and the, the Satan comes in there and the Lord says, well, where have you come from? And Satan's like, I've been going back and forth on the earth. And it's interesting how the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? I mean, think about this. Have you considered my servant Rick? Do you know that God might be saying that about you? Have you considered my servant Henry? Have you considered? You know that God is telling that to the devil. Wow. Basically, God is willing to allow you to be tested he's willing to allow you to be tested because he's confident that if you stay close to him you'll persevere through it right he was confident that job would would persevere through it and so satan kind of replies in verse 9 does job fear god for nothing satan replied have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has you have blessed the work of his hand so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land but now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. See, remember, what is the, what is the target in today's lesson? It's the body of Christ. It's the body, right? And what we see here is that Job is being put into the spotlight by God. Job is put into the spotlight of the devil by, you know, by God. And God is basically telling Job, okay, Job, it's time for you to get into this ring. You're ready to fight this good fight right now? Time to get in the ring. But Job has no idea it's coming. He has no idea. 
And, uh, and what is Satan saying to God when God brings him up as an example? Well, he says the only reason that Job is worshiping you is because you've given him everything he wants and you've taken care of him and protected him. And you know what's pretty sad is that in today's society, most people, they will turn away from God if things don't go their way. They say, how could God allow this to happen to me? And they get bitter and they get hard-hearted towards God and they walk away from their relationship with God. And that's true for many religious people. And that's what Satan was saying would happen to Job is that if you take away everything you've given him, Job is going to curse you to your face. And it's sad because a lot of religious people today, they can feel entitled to things going right in their life because they've done their duty. I showed up to church. I've been giving 10% every Sunday. For, for years and years, and now, God, you allow this to happen to me? Are you serious? Or I've been to church. I've even driven all the way to Washington, D.C. to go to church. on. So you know how far away that is? That's like a two-hour drive. I'm entitled to things going my way. But what that shows is that those with that kind of mindset in the religious world are not there because of the cross of Christ. They just want to check in and check out and try to check box their way to heaven. But then when things go not their way, they don't know where to turn to. But with Job, the thing about Job, we're not going to read exactly word for word the whole story, but he loses his children, his possessions. Everything that he has is basically gone, and it all happens on one day. Like, he goes through everything in one day. And uh, when he gets news of this in verse 20, that's what we'll pick it up here in verse 20, Job 1 verse 20. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship. I mean, what would you do? What would you do if you found out that you, you lost not only your, all your wealth? I mean, we talked about the stock market crashing, right? Appreciate Jade sharing that in contribution today. But what if you found out you lost all your wealth, your house basically burned to the ground, and not only that, but all of your kids and all your relatives all died on the same day due to some freak accident? I mean... Job responded by falling to the ground in worship. And he says in verse 21, Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And all this Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Basically everything he had, God had the right to take away. Everything that we have, God has given to us. We can be grateful on this Thanksgiving for all that God has given to us. But God has the right to take it away if he wants to. Chapter 2, verse 1. So that's what happened, and, and uh, Satan didn't get what he wanted, right? He wanted Job to uh, curse God, but, let, but he responded by worshiping. Now, chapter 2, verse 1. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth and going back and forth on it. You know what's funny about the devil is that we, we can be unaware of his schemes, but it's not because we didn't know what they are. Satan's schemes are, are very consistent in our life. He's going to try to attack the exact same way very consistently. That's the thing about the devil. He's consistent. He's not necessarily creative, though. He's not going to invent a new way to try to get you. He's going to use the way, the same way that he's been doing it for all time, consistently doing the same thing, try to get you to turn away like so many people have also done. Verse 3. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, he is on your hands, but you must not but but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. You know, it's pretty funny about this passage is uh, your spouse, the right spouse can help you make your way to heaven. The wrong spouse will lead you straight to hell. And uh, it's also kind of interesting how uh, 
Satan attacked everybody but the spouse. It's like, why did he leave the spouse alive? Well, here she is trying to lead him straight to hell. In verse 10, he replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Notice how he didn't call her a sinful woman. He said, you're talking like a foolish woman. Amen. He didn't, he didn't uh, call her a name right there. But Satan did a pretty thorough job of attacking Job. And what was his target? It was his body. He, his, everything he had and now his body. And what was Satan's weapon? What was he trying to attack him with? It was suffering. Satan was attacking Job with suffering. Question for you is, do you appreciate suffering in your life? A woman who gives birth to a child appreciates all the suffering, not just of that day, but the nine months prior, because now they have a brand new baby. Isn't that pretty awesome? A woman who wants to be a mother will appreciate that suffering to get the baby. An athlete, a champion athlete, will appreciate the suffering it takes to go through all the training it takes to hurt and beat their body into submission so they become a champion athlete. They appreciate suffering. But you know, as disciples, we have to remember that if we're going to follow Jesus, that there is going to be suffering in our life. And in the book of Job, one thing we have to remember about suffering is that God is the one who set the conditions for Job. In our life, God is the one who sets the conditions for our suffering. When we go through something, God is the one who allowed those conditions for us to suffer. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. The target's the body. The weapon is suffering. Let's go to Philippians 1, verse 27. It says, whatever happens... Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now here that I still have. I mean, it's pretty powerful in verse 29, especially where it says that it's granted to us not just to believe, but also to suffer. Many of us went to school at one point. I, I got grant money when I went to school. You know, you fill out your FAFSA. Students know what I'm talking about right here. You fill out your FAFSA, you, you get your uh, scholarship, maybe, if you get a scholarship, but sometimes you get grant money. The cool thing about grant money is that it's not a loan. You don't have to pay that back, right? That's a grant. Or, or people write grants to get from the government to give them money to support their, their uh, scientific efforts or whatever. People want grants. It's grant money that's given to them. But you know what's pretty awesome about being a disciple? What we're granted is suffering. That's what it says right there in Philippians 1. It's like our grant money. I get to believe in Jesus, and now I'm being rewarded with this suffering? Well, you know, this coming, uh, you know, Christmas is coming, right? Christmas is coming. Sydney and I already have a Christmas tree up. That was a funny story. I didn't go out of my way for this. I found a Christmas tree. It's like brand new for free, all right? So ask me later about that. But Christmas is coming, and, you know, it's kind of fun to give each other gifts on Christmas, and to get gifts, and that's fun, but what if that special someone comes and gives you this little box, and it's so awesome, and oh, wow, thank you so much, and you open the box, and you, you can't wait, December 25th, right? You, oh, you wake up in the morning, and you open the box, and gym membership. <laughs> what are you trying to say? That would be the question out of my mouth. What are you trying to say? A gym membership. Are you serious? What? That would be a kind of offensive thing, right? Because, because it's like, well, yeah, I'm going to give you the gym membership. You, re you need to go put it into practice. Like, wow. So instead of giving me something that I, have to en I can enjoy, you're telling me I need to go to the gym? Well, yeah, I want you to be stronger. I want you to you know, do better. I want you to be better than you are right now. Yeah, and that's what it is. Going to the gym... It's suffering, isn't it? It's, it's suffering. You, you beat your body to get stronger. 
But if, if you get a gym membership, it's because somebody wants you to be better or stronger than you are right now. But that means if you're really going to use it, because you could just say, oh, thanks, and then just throw it. But if you're really going to use that new card to get into the gym, that means you're going to go to the gym frequently and put in the work to actually use what you've been given. But for us today, we have to realize that God puts us through suffering to help us get better. He allows us to go through suffering to help us get better. When we're suffering, do we trust that God is truly in control of our suffering? Sometimes we can be afraid of what God knows we can handle. Sometimes we can be afraid of what God knows we can handle. God knew what Job could handle, right? He knew what Job would be able to stand through, and he said, okay, I'm going to allow this to happen. But, but we can be afraid of how much does God think I can handle, we have to trust that God is our, uh, our referee, all right? When you get into a, a match or, or for, for me, more like a coach in a sense, because uh, when I played football in high school, you know, a few years later, my senior year of high school, we, we did okay. Again, I was, still wasn't that good at it, but I gave my heart. And we got in trouble for something. I don't remember exactly. Somebody made fun of somebody inappropriately that was trying to help us out. I don't know. Football players are meatheads, I'll just say that. So they line us up, the coach lines us up on the, on the, the goal line of a football field, and he, he marked out 40 yards, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, and, and uh, blew the whistle. All right, we're gonna run sprints, go. One, one sprint, 40 yard dash. Okay, all right, turn around, run back, ready? Oh, two times, okay. How many times is he gonna make us do this? It's kind of a punishment. All right, we're in trouble. We're going to be running for a little bit, so how much? Okay, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, ten times, is that enough? All right, no, keep going. Fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, thirty-five. You know, running, running, running. Forty times. We had to run 40-yard dashes, but here's the thing. If you knew you were going to run 40 times, you'd probably pull back a little bit, wouldn't you? You'd probably pull back like, oh, I'll just save my energy for a little bit later, but... We didn't know how many times we we're going to do. And the coaches know if you're not giving your heart. Because they know what you're capable of. And if you kind of pull your heart back, they will be on you. And they will make you run more. And so, and so part of trusting God is trusting that we're going to be pushed to the place that we're going to be, able, like, to our limits. But it's never going to be too much for us. God is going to allow us to go through things. But the problem is that during our suffering, we don't want to give our whole heart to the suffering and understanding that, that God is, is, he's not punishing us. That's the difference, right? For me in, in high school football, we were getting punished. But, but for God, he's not punishing us. He's just training us. He wants us to be better. And when God says time, like he throws in the towel, right? When you're, when you're boxing or whatnot, there's a referee that calls it before it can get too, too out of hand. God is that person for us. And we got to trust God's timing with how long he wants us to suffer when we go through what we go through. His target is our body. His weapon is our suffering. The ultimate goal of Satan, because Satan wants to attack our body, Satan wants to make us suffer, but the goal is to make us really impatient with God's will. See, when things get tough, you kind of see who someone really is when they go through suffering. And when things get tough, when God's will is hard for us, we have to hold on. It's not always easy, but we can go through many rounds of fighting and fighting and fighting and suffering. And then we get to this point where it's like, okay, how long am I really supposed to keep fighting this fight? Is this how it's supposed to feel for my whole life? And we can get impatient, and rather than being surrendered to God's timing on things in our life, we make a decision to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And actually, an example of this, you know, is when people decide that they want to marry the wrong person. Because instead of waiting for Mr. Right, people will go for Mr. Right Now, or Mrs. Right, Mrs. Right Now, Right? The person that is there, and because I'm suffering by being alone, and I'm suffering by following God the right way, you know, giving in to whoever I want to marry right now, and then you suffer the consequences later on for that. But we can want to take control because we know we're supposed to hold on and be righteous through our suffering. But then you're like, man, can I just get a break here, Lord? Like, I'm suffering for so long. Can I just get a break? I mean, I, I want to get stronger, but... I'm kind of tired. It's kind of like I went to the gym with Rick for the first time a few months ago, 
and uh, and I'm like, okay, I'm ready to get back in. This is gonna be awesome. You know, I'm all pumped up. And after after doing like one set of the bench, I'm like, okay. And then the second set, I was done because I hadn't done it in so long. I was like, you know, your arms are shaking like that. I'm like, wow, this is tough. It's like, oh yeah, we got three more sets. And all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, Rick, really? Like, can I be done? Can I be done? No, we gotta push through it. You know, give your heart through it. And you know, I appreciate that. We all need that. But we can try to, if I wouldn't go through that, then I wouldn't get stronger. And in the same way, when we give up on when things get a little tough, we don't really learn what we're supposed to learn from God. Let's look at James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse 10. James 5, verse 10. It says, brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And you know, it talks about Job right here in the New Testament. I'm pretty sure it's the only place that mentions Job in the New Testament. But Job persevered and we saw what the Lord finally brought about. But it says the Lord is full of compassion. What compassion really means is basically being a companion in suffering. To have compassion on someone is to join with someone in suffering. It's like the word compassion. Passion meaning suffering, like the movie Passion of the Christ is all about the suffering of Christ. Compassion is companionship through suffering. And that's who Christ is for us. He's, he's really compassionate on us because he went through it himself. But Satan's purpose was to try to get Job to become impatient through his suffering and to give up. But ultimately, Job persevered and pushed through. And he's an example written for us. But Satan knows that if he can make us impatient in our walk with God, we'll do something stupid. Some of us maybe have some experience boxing or martial arts. I mean, not me. I did Taekwondo when I was about this tall, like, you know, six, seven years old. I wasn't that great at it, but hence all the sports I wasn't that great at. But, you know... <laughs> When it comes to boxing, the point when you get really experienced is you want to get inside your enemy's head. And if you can get them to get mad and to, and to get upset, then they do something out of frustration or anger. And instead of sticking with what they know they should be doing, they do something out of anger. That's when you get struck. Is when you decide to give up because you're angry at the situation. Satan gets in your head and you decide, I'm just going to throw in the towel. I'm going to do it my way. That's when Satan comes in and just comes for you. Because he wants to mess with your mind, get you frustrated and angry. But what's our defense? Because the target, right, what's the target? The body. The weapon is the suffering. The weapon is the suffering, right? The goal is to make us impatient with God's will and his timing. But what is our defense? Our defense is to stay grateful. We have to stay grateful. We live in a very entitled society, worried about those superficial things. Christmas is coming and people want to make money, don't they? But we got to stay grateful. Let's look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4 verse 4. It says, rejoice in the Lord when you feel like it. Oh, wait, is that what it says? Are we all reading the same Bible, guys? Rejoice in the Lord when you're not suffering. Nope. Nope. It says rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. You know, the fact that it even has to tell us to rejoice in the Lord always is because in our nature we don't want to rejoice always. I know. It's a command to rejoice in the Lord always. You know, this past Thursday we had a Bible talk about whether or not gratitude is a feeling or is gratitude a choice. And in the same way, rejoicing is not necessarily a feeling. There's emotion associated with it, but rejoicing is a choice you make. To rejoice in the Lord always. And you can tell when someone's not rejoicing in the Lord, because look what verse 5 says. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Someone who's all strung up. It's like, hey, how you doing? It's like, they, they, they kind of are on edge. They're not gentle. 
Or it's like Sydney knows this, unfortunately. You know, our wives know are the best of us and the worst of us. So if I'm like got a lot going on, Sydney's like, hey, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Sydney, just like, I need, you know, you can react kind of harshly when you're not rejoicing in the Lord for some situation. It says, let your gentleness be evident to all. If you're rejoicing in the Lord, you're gentle. And it says, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, verse 6, but in every petition by prayer, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's pretty powerful that the Lord knows we're going to be in tough situations. So he says to rejoice. The Lord knows we're going to be ungrateful sometimes for those tough situations. So he says, in every situation, pray with thanksgiving in your heart. We want to be at peace in our relationship with God. And how do we do that? Verse 7, the peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. When we stay grateful. We stay focused on what God has already done for us. We have to be committed and believe that suffering in our life is really going to produce in us the character that God wants us to have. Suffering helps us to be better men and women for God. But the question is, are we embracing the suffering? Do we see it as the grant money from the Lord? Like, wow, when something is about to happen, wow, I'm rejoicing. Right? I don't know about you guys. It's not natural for me if something bad happens just to immediately be like, I'm so excited. This is awesome. Right? You know, I... I that's just not natural, but that's where the scripture comes in because we don't hold by our feelings. We hold by the word of God. So rejoice always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Because if we're going to build this church the way that God wants it to be, and we're going to win the state of Delaware, we're going to have to suffer, and that's just the truth. We've got to be ready to go through it. You've got to be willing to suffer for the truth. And, you know, some people try to preach inspirational lift up messages and I and I get that but at the same time we got to be real about what God's word says and how to actually respond through suffering I appreciate Georgina shared during communion today we have to be willing to suffer for the truth and be sober about whether or not we have been real good soldiers of Christ Jesus does my oath and my good confession that Jesus is Lord does it still stand because Jesus died so that we can truly live so as we suffer, let's honor him, give our best, and this Thanksgiving be the light of what it means to really stay grateful as our defense against Satan's schemes. And to God be the glory. Amen.